for Jabari Gibson.
University and I am majoring in broadcast journalism with a concentration in broad well I'm majoring in mass communication with a concentration in broadcast journalism and I'm minoring in marketing from the beautiful city of Houston Texas and I am so excited to be here today I'm really excited to be here today so thank you guys for enjoy uh, for uh, joining us today on our pre-event interviews. Now it's my pleasure to welcome the director of programs, Miss Terry Braden. All of you who are here, as Jasmine introduced me, I am Terry Braden, the director of programs here at the Valdry Center for Philanthropy, located on the campus of Southern University and A and M College in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's my pleasure to work welcome you to both of our Window into Practice seminar featuring Ms. Kelly Gully, Chief of Staff from Arthur Blank Family Foundation, and Lindsay Louie, CEO of Enlight Foundation. That begins at the top of the year and our special free interview by our Southern University students will begin right now. Our students have prepared some questions for our for our panelists. And we'll begin with Jabraylan Gibson, a senior major in criminal justice with a minor in social work. Uh, Jabraylan from Cullen, Louisiana, that's North Louisiana, near Newport. He's committed to giving back to his community and has worked on several projects with our foundation. Jabraylan is interviewing Miss Kelly Kelly. <laughs> Well, hello, Ms. Gully. How are you doing today? I'm doing just fine, Jabraylin. That's great. I'm, and we would like to say for the Vagrants to say thank you and welcome. You here, you are just like family to us. And I hope you really enjoyed us on our previous day. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank you. So I have a, some questions for you, Mrs. Uh, Gully, out of the history that I had learned about you and the knowledge. So in your career in the flesh, you had been marked by many roles. What key moments have shaped your career in the field? Well, Jabraylin, I am, again, just so glad. This is my first time ever at Southern University. Yeah. And so I'm really excited to be here. I already feel like family. Uh, so thank you for that. And, you know, I have had a lot of roles in the It's really shaped the work that I did in the community with nonprofits before I got to And so I took a few notes. I'm going to highlight a couple things. Um, I worked under the tutelage of my own at a place called the Community Development in Palo Alto, California for the first 10 or 11 years um, of my career. And I think that's where I fell in love with the, the nonprofit and helping community be better, be better, better organizations um, to be in the mix to serve them. And when we were um, at CDI, uh, I, I think there's like three key experiences that okay. shaped my work in foundation. One is working to raise money from the foundation yes. as an executive, as a person in the community that had a mission to do certain things that we needed money to be able to do. The second thing is working as a community engagement advisor to foundation. So when foundation wanted to go to the ground or as we go to the ground when they go out into community, how do they do it in a way that honors the community and allows it to be heard. We did a lot of that um, at CDI. And then working inside foundations as a senior program officer, as an interim president, now as a chief of staff, has allowed me to take all of the experience as a director and an experienced consultant into being in the foundation. Uh, and I'm to tell you why you talk it. You the main thing I heard about the community that you was very big on community. Yeah. So my just about is this. What strategies have you found most effectively in the community engagement? Yeah, so community engagement. Um, we define community engagement as helping community have the opportunity to understand what's happening all around them, right? To say, people that um, uh, this is the place where we live, work, worship, and play. This is the place that we know about most, right? So when I think about the working community I also think about the principle. One of the principles that we operated on was honor the work and the work will honor. Um, honor the work and the work will honor. And so um, our primary approach was to ensure that we entered the community with humility. 
not with I got an MBA so I know or I got a PhD or let me tell you how you should be living or working but really with the community and the listening and understanding that they're the experts the ones that are there are on the ground however there may be some expertise that actually need that I can bring and share with them and help them um, be stronger we are um, the other thing that's important uh, for me and working with communities is to ensure that the community gave us their voice. Wow. So what do I mean by that? When, when we go out into the community and we ask individuals to share your story, how's it been? What are things that you want to do? Or what have been the challenges? There's a lot of tough challenges in communities all across the nation, right? And um, and so so our intent, I'll give you an example. I did a lot of work in um, Detroit uh, with the Children's Foundation. They had an initiative back in the day called building up, called um, the better neighbor, the be better neighborhood. Uh, oh no, good neighbor, good neighborhood. Yeah, that's what we called it. And uh, we got yeah, really a privilege. We got a chance to work with different communities in Detroit mm -hmm. that represented children with the highest need, um, whether that be poverty, whether that be schools or resources that weren't there. And we invited the community into a room like this, where hundreds and hundreds of people would come together, parents, um, teachers, community helpers, workers, et cetera. And we would ask them, what is your hope for your young kids? What is your hope for the community? What are the challenges? We can hear all of that. And shame on us. If we hear all of that, and we take it and go do our work with it. Yes. Instead, we would have a series of meetings hear what they said, bring that back. Um, we partnered with the University of Michigan, which worked. Right? Mm -hmm. um, they had a technical assistance center where students like yourself would come and kind of comb through what we heard and do research about it. If there was a concern about education, they'd bring back to the community, here's what's happening in the community. And in that next meeting, we would bring their voice back to them. And say, here's what we learned about the things that were on your mind. Um, and the community really appreciated because it wasn't us extracting, taking information or stories out of community. It was us all learning together about what was there and how we could do better. And so that's just one example um, of one of the things that's really, really important to me. Um, really, even in my work today, when I get feedback, I want to be able to share with people what I've done with that feedback and be able to kind of what we call cold solution. Okay. So yeah, I, I'm listening to you and you getting back to the community being a voice as a superhero to your community. <laughs> being, <laughs> a, being a superhero to your community and helping out. So basically, that's the whole energy is being a leadership social community. That's great, good, good for it. So my next question is this right here. What if I put you out when it comes to choosing a good path? Mm. Well, I'm going to tell you this. I was going to be the first medical doctor in this family. Really? So I went to undergrad. And I I um, majored in pre med zoology. So I have a bachelor's in zoology. So I chose your path. And it didn't quite work that way, <laughs> right? Instead, I got married. Um, still married to that guy 38 years later. So that was a good decision, even though my mom didn't think it was a good decision. Yet. <laughs> and so I will say that what happened was I discovered the passion of what my dad did. My dad, Frank Lomax, was a leader in the Urban League movement. He was the president of the Urban League in Columbus, Ohio. And then he became the executive vice president of the National Urban League in New York City. And what I understood at the time was that dad was doing something that he was very passionate about, which was helping Black folks get jobs and housing. And I wanted to go to work in that same kind of field. I started out my career right after I got married in Brooklyn. And I was kind of like, okay, so we balanced at the end of the day. And people love banking. I'm not doing on the banking career. For me, it wasn't enough to make me want to say, you know what, I'm going to be working in my life that matters and so i started working uh, in the community volunteering in community and then really getting jobs in the nonprofit sector i've been in the nonprofit sector ever since so what i tell my kids is three things one find what you love to do and then find a job that will pay you to do 
because then you're not getting up and going to work every day. Instead, you really are getting a new forward passion that you have to work um, every day. The second thing I say is be open-minded, have a growth mindset. My dad kind of, I think my dad knew I didn't really want to go to med school uh, because about halfway through my undergrad, he said, business you can explore a little bit. But I was mine, you know, I was really uh, set on, I'm going to do this in four years. I'm going to do this. I'm not changing my mate. Um, and what's so funny about that is I got, you know, my career in pre-med zoology, and then I went to business school. <laughs> and got my so if I'd have listened to that earlier, maybe my path would have been different. I don't know, in business. Um, but I used my MBA to ensure that nonprofits and those things are able to implement um, business practices in a way that honors the community, honors the work, work uh, honors them. And then the last thing that I'll that I'll say is, um, I don't know what our time is, um, but I want to. Uh, um, I'm in the room, already incorporated. Uh, but one of the poems that we had to memorize uh, when I was pledging, I don't still have a new voice. I always have a new voice. Yes. It's called "Don't Fit." I'm gonna. I'm just gonna share this poem because that's one of the things you're looking at that career path and journey. Don't stop. Don't stop. So don't quit. Says when things go wrong, as they sometimes go, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debt are high, and you want to smile because the sky, the air is pressing you down a bit. Rest, us, but don't you? Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure turns about when he might have won if he stuck it out. Don't give up till the penny seems slow. He might succeed with another blow. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor self. And he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out. The silver tint of clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems really far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse. You must be fit. Wow. And I'm saying that to you as you're doing your journey as a senior here. <laughs> you want to know a little something about when, when she was talking, when you were the first in your family to go to prison? Yes. I'm the first one in my family to ever go to college as a male. Earn a degree in social degree social work and then earn another degree in just like my social work. Yeah. So it very it played a big difference in my family and towards my career to also to learn. I tell like every child that in high school or in I tell them this if that's how you say how you finish. Whatever goes you go for, go for it. And then and the closest chance is sharp on six. Every night he used to look up at the sky. I would say, you do not want to be in the position that he is. Is he growing up in this country of joy? As he, uh, he looked at role models around his community, and what he do, big brother, went to the NFL, did a lot of fun, do a lot of fun. And so now you see him. Now. So it really doesn't matter which how you start, it's how you finish. That's right. And on top of that, you could be one of the biggest, you could be the president, you could be in the As long as you have a good person and go out by yourself, you can do it. foundation. Help me out and teach me the double how to everything and how to how to grow, how to network, how to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. So thank you to the friends always been with for the past three years or so. Yeah. So that's my last question. And I'm really excited to talk with you also. I know you get like very tired. So my last question is when you're not working, what do you like to do in your personal life? Well, my husband and I like to travel all over. Um, um but one of the key things that we really, really enjoy doing is hanging out with three grandkids. <laughs> Carmen, Ricky, and Landon, eight, four, and three. Um, and uh, spending the time with our children, with our families. You know, we just had a big family gathering around my husband's birthday. Family means everything. And so when my family's good, I'm good. Even if it's been a 12 hour day, I can come home, talk to the kids, talk to my son, my daughter really get a sense of what's happening in their lives, support each other, laugh together, sometimes cry together. But that is where I I get my, my energy um, and my drive to continue because I want this world to be a better place for Carmen and Ricky and Landon when they have their children and their children's children and their 
like I said, eight, four and three. I want this world to be a better place. The work that I do contributes to making sure that that happens. Well, they your records have a blessed grandmother who's going to bring them, I mean, make memories with them so they can share with their kids about what they do. It was, it was a very special brother. I want to say thank you for the and talking to you. I learned so much about you and getting to know you very well. And can I just say congratulations on your first interview ever? You did a phenomenal job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you who may have logged in early to um, view our interviews by our foundation interns, Braylon is leading now with Miss Kelly. Thank you again. Our well, Poetry Center was established through the vision of two alumni, Leon and Warren. And so we're bringing to the stage now a third generation uh, Valdry, our reporter, and she is going to be interviewing Miss Lindsay Louie. Take your time, ladies. Take your time, <laughs> ladies. The family tradition of attending Southern University is, is um, a part of our next student interviewer. Grandfather, her mother, and now she is that third generation. She'll be interviewing Miss Lindsay Lou from California. And guess what, everybody? Who is our reporter? She's from California. So this is a great fun of them. Thank you, Tara. Well, first, welcome, Miss Lou. Thank you. Thank you for being here today during our Founders Week. And also, I thank you for your long time support of the Policy Center. Um, I know you've worked with us when you were at the Cuba Foundation. I remember you seeing it up here, and you're like, I work there. So I really want to thank you for coming today. <laughs> I do have a couple questions I want to get to know you. I know we talked a little bit before, but I want to get to know you. A little more, you know. So, uh, my first question is if you could please share with us what out to you the most about the vision of the Valdry Center that inspired your involvement and investment with us. Um, well, Cara, I'm so glad to be here. How's the sound of it? Loud to myself. Um, <laughs> I'm like having this conversation just with you, but booming <laughs> out in the room. Um, so, it's really nice to be here and I'm really excited with one another today. Um, in terms of the Valdry Center, uh, the, the role I had at the Hewlett Foundation was thinking about how do we make the field of philanthropy, the sector that's about providing resources, but how do we keep it strong? How do we keep learning? How do we keep them connected to each other? How do we promote really good practices in the field? And so we funded a lot of um, different projects in that spirit, um, including publications for the so we funded um, philanthropy. We funded the Stanford Social Innovation Review Journal, and we also funded philanthropy centers. Um, we, there was one at Stanford, right near the foundation, in our backyard, mm -hmm. and one at Indiana University that we had supported. And um, getting to know the Valdry Center was sort of like the perfect combination of all of those things because we read about it in the Chronicle of Philanthropy. And this was the first management center that was going to be starting up at an HBCU here at Center in Baton And we knew how important philanthropy centers were because we supported these other ones around the country. Um, and so my boss at the time, now at the Kelly Blood Foundation, Sage Horsky, said, she brought, I remember she brought in the Chronicle of Philanthropy and put it on my desk and said, we need to, we need to meet them. And as we got to know, um, and Terry and we had to Zoom because it was during COVID, <laughs> but we saw the beautiful building on Zoom. Um, I think we just really understood right away how important it is to have a center like this, both for the campus, but also for the community. Yeah. In terms of being a place that people can come to learn, share ideas, do research for the field, and you need really diverse perspectives. Yeah. I mean, it's so important for many species to have public research, but to get, to get it started here. And so I think we just knew, we couldn't have told you where will the center be in five or 10 or 20 years, but that wasn't the point. It, we know the world needs that. We know Southern University is off to a great start with the center. And if what we can do is provide a little extra support to help that happen, then that was a 
I am so glad you chose our school to be the first patient for you to we didn't them. choose all credit to Southern and to Baldry <laughs> and everybody else. We just we just joined the train. I'm glad you joined the train. And you the best Thank you. Um, my second question is, your trajectory in philanthropy has been marked by various roles. How has your experience at SV2 and the William and Florent Hewlett Foundation influenced your strategies as CEO of the Enlight Foundation? That's a great question. So, um, Kelly was explaining a little of her career path in the last um interview and and mine has some similarities uh i was i was originally a pre-med student as well i majored oh. in human biology ended up in school and here i am <laughs> and um and what i would say is that i had a really diverse set of views and experiences we're going to talk more about kind of career path advice in a minute but i feel like each thing has offered me a set of experiences and network and preparation and they've sort of all come together really beautifully in this role. So I've worked for big nonprofits, I've worked for small ones, I've worked for nonprofits that raise money. So I know about fundraising, I know what it takes to do that fundraising and to figure out the budget every year. I've also worked for nonprofits like as well that earn money um, through selling things. And so that's a different role. And then the thing that you mentioned is a giving service. So individual donors like people with me today pull money together. Maybe on their own, they're not a philanthropist, but they can work together um, make grants. And then at Hewlett, I got to really learn about national and global philanthropy and what the kind of foundation that you read about in the newspaper, how they operate. And, and I've tried to bring all of those threads together at NY because it really has kind of best of all of those pieces. We're small and nimble, mm -hmm. but we're also very strategic in the um, way that we're trying to tackle the we're looking at because um, the problems are much bigger than any one dollar can solve. And so you really you can think about where can this philanthropic um, funding that we have to offer. Like, so I feel like I've drawn on each piece from the different kinds of organizations to understanding how the service works, mm -hmm. to knowing what the opportunities are, and then to really knowing how philanthropy can work at its best. Um, and bring all of that together. Wow. I, I just feel like everything was meant to happen for a reason. So you going to all those different types of fields and learning it all help as well I'm here y'all help with you uh, with the Enlight Foundation. I really that's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Um uh, my next question um uh, I just want about well I know we talk more about the career path, but I do want to get a little deeper. I also see you have any advice for us. So with you having a joint MBA and master of arts in education with school, go oh girl. <laughs> what inspired you to use philanthropy as a career path and what advice can you offer students like me when it comes to making a career choice? Yeah, it's a great question. It kind of builds on, on the last question. Mm -hmm. I had a question the other day. Um to Stanford and I had a student look at the alumni directory and email me as a senior, just like the students wow. that you all are in and say, you know, hey, I'm a senior, I'm looking out at the whole long career road can we talk? I have a question for you. I was thinking back to being a senior myself. And if you had told senior year Lindsay <laughs> that, you know, the past would unfold as it did, I'm not sure I would have believed you or I would have known I couldn't have predicted all of those steps. And so I do think that's in a way a first advice is you know you can you can sort of both have a plan it's good to have a plan mm -hmm. but also be because the, the the path can lead in interesting and different places you know that you might have expected um somebody said to me one time serendipity is when preparation meets opportunity mm -hmm. and i do think a lot of how unfolded is kind of serendipitous mm -hmm. and that at first it used to bother me like well how can this help my this is one of the most important parts of my life. How can it be serendipitous? That's, I want to feel like I have some control on that, even if it's an illusion. And I really think about those two those two levers of preparation and opportunity. So preparation is things like going to school here, showing up and being part of the volume center, showing up and being part of journalism, um, being part of sports, clubs, choir, we were talking about earlier. All of those things are preparation for career path ahead, whether it's, you know, 
me how to run an organization, manage a project, make a presentation, public speaking, persuade someone, market something, manage a budget. Like those skills are, are part of almost anything that one can be involved in, whether it's a volunteer activity or, or a paid activity, family, church, you name it. And so I think preparing, like using those opportunities and taking the time to notice what am I learning and what skills have I gained and what can I offer mm-hmm. the next time? That's the preparation lever. And then the opportunity lever, putting yourself out there in the past opportunities. If when Terry says, hey, do you want to come early and interview something? That's work. Yeah. You had different questions. You had to get ready. <laughs> this morning, you had to be like way more out and you were going about your day. You had mic'd up and come in here, but you've put yourself in the past opportunities to mm-hmm. be in this room to meet people. And so I think by doing that, it allows for so many more opportunities to open up um, than if you don't. And the flip side, of course, is it can feel a little scary because it is more work, more time, and sometimes the opportunity won't pan out. I have applied to many jobs that I did not get. And in the moment, it's harder. It's, your ego is a little bruised, and you know you put time and effort into it. It was stressful. But I think there's always something to learn from having done that or meet people doing that, that down the road you know, a new opportunity can present. So that's the biggest thing I see. In terms of ending up in philanthropy, um, I think I've always really wanted to work with people and and try to do my part to sort of leave the world better than I found it. Mm-hmm. And so philanthropy just feels like a really natural place to have the opportunity and the privilege to really be, I see it like being a bridge. Right, between different things. Of what do foundations have to offer? They have resources, financially, they have networks that they can offer, um, network capital, they can introduce people, they can put a spotlight on an issue that people pay attention when a about something. And I can be kind of a bridge that connects that to people and nonprofits and communities who are out trying to make a difference on all kinds of different issues. So it feels like kind of a natural place to have ended up. Yeah. I'm not sure I could have predicted it. Yeah. Wow. I like the bridge scenario. That's really cool. And then I do appreciate you saying, um, like volunteering and being a part of the clubs and things like that. It do help because I see it happen to me and I, I'm only a long go ahead. But I have seen, you know, but then I see different opportunities that come out that's not a part of my direct path, but I'm going to take those opportunities because I can take other opportunities for different fields. So I've, I've learned to really connect with you on that part. So. I think it's really true, Karen. I think if you can um, notice your energy when you do those things yeah. and notice, like, what is it that I've, I seem to be continuously excited to do, um, you can follow that energy. Good thing. Good thing. If I, I'm going to follow that energy. Thank you. I do have one last question. It's not about philanthropy. It's, it's about you, your personal life. So what would you think of your personally outside of your professional endeavor? Oh, it's a great question. Um, and I, I was thinking about that before we sat down, and there's a couple of answers. I mean, the biggest one is I probably talked about that a few years ago. My family's really important to me. I'm lucky to live near a lot of family. <laughs> I have been in middle school, so I feel like I have a, a sort of a fleeting amount of time <laughs> left. Time, so I'm really savoring things like driving them to the mall um, <laughs> right now. We've got COVID dogs, so that's also quite a commitment. Um, and uh, in terms of this kind of a creative outlet, I really love um, to take pictures and then be like a story for my family and friends. So I'm always sending them pictures or reminding people what happened like this day last year or um, making photo albums. That so yeah. I have a few small minutes to do yeah, I like that. My mom, she has photos in her phone, in her new phone that from like when I was born, I'm like, oh, how do you keep all those photos? And I do have to turn now because I feel like I'm alive every single moment I need these moments so I I really like that and I also scrapbooking so scrapbooking is really fun so fun well thank you so much Miss Lindsay I am so glad that I got to know you better I'm so glad that you're with us at the foundation and that you 
at the, you ran with our vision and you are making my twist together. So. Well, keep it going. I can't oh. wait to see what you're going to do out in the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay and Kyra. <laughs> and our panelists, a great pan today. Uh, again, we're here at the today is Founders <laughs> Week here at Southern University and AM and College. And so we have a lot of activities going on on the campus, from the library's month of events, all the way down to a basketball game from yesterday, this week's activities. Uh, so we thank you all again. And we'll take a short pause right now. Our one o'clock event at the College of Social Philanthropy Fireside Chat with two awesome, awesome foundation leaders will begin at 105. Thank you.
Welcome to Southern University and A&M College, Baldry Center for Philanthropy. This is Founders Week. The university has been in existence since 1880. That's over 140 plus years. So we are happy to be able to present to our audience who are joining us via YouTube Live, Facebook Live, and here in person, here at the Valdry Center for Philanthropy. The Valdry Center for Philanthropy is an academically based research center focused on philanthropic studies and nonprofit management. VCP seeks to educate the socially conscious student, volunteer, and practitioner in the emerging field of philanthropic studies through, the exploring, through exploring the economic, historical, and philosophical rationales for voluntary action in the local, national, and international arena. I want to welcome today our two guests. What is so awesome today is this is not only Founders Week, but it is also National Women's Day. Who would have known that today, after planning over six months for this opportunity to share these young ladies to pass? as foundation leaders on this awesome occasion. So good afternoon. I'm here to welcome for our fireside chat, Ms. Kelly Gully, Chief of Staff of the Arthur M. Family Foundation. Also we have today, Ms. Lindsay Louie, CEO of Enlight Foundation. Ladies, take a minute. Thank you so much, Terry, on behalf of Kelly and myself for having us here. And for those of you who've come in person, it's really special for both of us to be here at the Audrey Center and on the Southern University campus. And also to all of you zooming in from, or not zooming, but I guess YouTubing in from wherever you are around the world, we're really glad that you could take this time out of your day for this conversation. Um, Kelly and I have worked together uh, for a long time, and so we wanted to frame today as kind of a conversation in the way that we work together. So rather than standing up at the podium, which would be great for the talk, we wanted to just have a conversation with each other. So we planned a couple of, of questions back and forth that we think will help kind of set the stage about our careers and philanthropy and the social sector. Um, and after we go back and forth on those, we're really excited to open it up to conversation all of you. I don't know if those of you out in the internet can send in questions, but at least for the folks in the room, um, be thinking about what you want to talk about or if you have an experience um, that you want to build on, on something that we shared. I think that's one of the most meaningful places of taking time to do something like this. So we're excited to get to that. But, but first, hi. Hello, Lindsay. How are you today? It's so nice to be here with you, Kelly. Really special. Um, Kelly and I were on a work trip almost exactly a year ago today in Montana together. So this is almost becoming a tradition. Yeah, let's make it a tradition. I'm not sure where we're going to go next March, but <laughs> for work. Um, so I thought we could start, Kelly, in our back and forth, just talking a little bit about how we came to be doing what we're doing today. Can you talk about your past um, that led you to being chief of staff at the Blank Foundation? Yeah, so I am um, delighted to be here again, first time in Baton Rouge, first time at other university got a university tour earlier, and there's there's something special about this place. I can already feel it, and so it's really glad to be here. And when I think about philanthropy and my journey into philanthropy, um, uh, I didn't major in philanthropy first. First thing, I didn't grow up and say I wanted to be chief of staff of a foundation. I was going to be the first medical doctor in the family, so I went to undergrad and got my degree in zoology from Ohio University um, in Athens, Ohio, and then all of them got married and didn't go to med school. <laughs> so I'm still married, 38 years married to that same guy. Um, but I do think about how um, I started in banking, and I really wanted something that was more fulfilling uh, in my life, to be able to know that I made a difference when I got home at night, and I got that from my dad. 
I'm an urban league rep. My dad was the president of the urban league of Ohio and then the executive vice president of the National Urban League. And he always had this spark about him. He was working on making sure that black folks were able to get jobs and housing. Um, it was really important work. And so just watching him uh, and watching my uncle, who I ended up starting my nonprofit development in Palo Alto, California, um, I learned about philanthropy from the other side, from working in nonprofit, from raising money from philanthropy. So like first to really understand what is a grant, what is a grant report and why, um, and doing that work, and then being able to become a community helper with philanthropy and be able to help philanthropy understand how to work with community because that's what we did. And now being inside philanthropy to help kind of draw from those experiences in, in what I actually do today. And so it, it wasn't a straight path. Let's put it that way. What about you? Um, it was so interesting to have this conversation. And to, despite knowing you as well as I do, to not have connected the dots before today, I was pre-med in college. I don't know what the takeaway is from this talk. Um, I majored in human biology at Stanford out in California, and people have often asked me if I like regret that because on paper, my career doesn't have a whole lot to do with human biology, but I beg to differ because we are all humans, that's right. and I learned a lot about being human, whether that's health, mental health, how the brain works, psychology, sociology, and community. So I actually, to me, while it, it isn't a straight line, it all kind of makes sense backwards. And I'm really thankful to have had that grounding and kind of like people and how and how we work. But um, I, at the end of college, I had a really good friend and her daughter got cancer, and she's doing great actually. She's now a senior at Harvard. But um, it was really hard to go through that and be so close to it. And I just thought I felt it so deeply. I thought I really want to work with people. I I want to um, sort of leave. The world better. I think I'm an, an optimist, and and I, I feel like when I see an opportunity for something to change, I just I'm, I believe it can be different and better. Um, but I felt like that was too hard. <laughs> um, and too, I felt it too deeply, and so then I thought, my family, everyone's lawyers. So I thought, well, I'll be a lawyer. I'll help. I'll work with kids. I'll work with kids in foster care, or um, you know. Uh, sort of civil rights, rights for people who don't have them or they're threatened. And so I worked at a legal services nonprofit. And I volunteered at all kinds of nonprofits, never really getting paid throughout high school and college. This was the first time I worked at one. And that was a different perspective, right? Because I was, I was out of college, doing on my own. I was seeing kind of the whole organization and not just my little 18-year-old volunteer slice of it. And I was really thankful that we had lawyers and people in the office to help clients with Needed. But what drove me was thinking about how can we raise more money, how can we run this organization even better so that we can serve more people, we can expand the work. I wanted to like be the executive director. And so that was the path to business school. <laughs> I guess it had always been leading there, but but I just it just I just lit up doing that work, thinking about how do we get resources. And I think I'm, I'm sort of a connector or a bridger. And so, um, and so then the path just unfolded from there. I went to business school with the idea that I would stay in the social sector, and I've had all sorts of different and interesting jobs in the sector, and each one has kind of led to the next one. And at one point, um, I became the executive director of a giving circle, and it was such a great job for me at the right moment, and it felt sort of random. Like, what, how did What's I, a giving circle? Giving circle, thank you, Kelly. Is, um, a, is a collection of donors who pull money together and then give it away as a group. And they're, they're put together in all sorts of less or more formal ways around the world. This one was pretty formalized. Donors would give um, somewhere between like two and $5,000 and it would get pooled. And then we'd have like 100,000 or 200,000 even that, we could, that they could work together and give it away. And it was just a, a great fit for me for all that kind of thing and bridging. But it felt kind of random. Like I ran into someone who was hiring. He said, wait, I, you're the perfect person. And I thought, how can getting this job that's so perfect for me be so random? And someone said to me, serendipity, like that kind of like random luck, is when preparation meets opportunity. 
it really made sense to me. This idea of like, you can prepare yourself for the jobs that you've had, the volunteering, the, the education, you know, any phase of your career, you can, you can be prepared for what might be next. And then you can put yourself in the pathway of opportunity. Right, go out to the event. If I hadn't gone to that event that night, I wouldn't have seen that woman. I wouldn't have that job, and that certainly is true of the job I have now at, at Invite. So, I guess I would say that that's kind of the, the underpinning um, formula <laughs> by which the path has unfolded. No, and absolutely, there's so many intersections. I'm not sure if I'm connections and intersections between me and. Um, and Lindsay, because I also went to business school <laughs> and got my MBA, but I agree with you about that integrity. And I was I had a daughter with illness, and my daughter actually passed away from an illness that I really felt as a mom, I was prepared to handle what came into my life because I had a background. So when I think about it now, I think, okay, I needed this as a mom to go to med school uh, to actually meet my parents. So that was just a thing that I think really um, uh, set me on a different path of meaning and hope and knowing that this work in the social sector matters. And that philanthropy, giving its time and talent, it just matters and it really does help. It's so true. Um, we can share this microphone. Is Kelly's working okay? Not really. I'll pass it to you. Yeah. Um, so, so Kelly and I met working in foundations. We happened to be in California at the time. You're going to solve look, this problem solver right here. Um, thank you. Uh, it's probably a whole room of problem solvers. That's why we're all here together. And. Um, we met working in foundations out in California. Kelly was at the James Irvine Foundation, and I was at the Hewlett Foundation, and we worked together on a collaborative fund. We're sort of like the Giving Cheerful but at Foundation. We pulled money together, and we worked together to give it away. So we've actually never worked in the same organization, but that's how we became colleagues and friends. And then Kelly went on to the Blank Foundation in Atlanta, and I went on to, to Enlight, where I am today. And so we've been in a few different of these kind of grant making and philanthropy organizations. And so Kelly, I thought it might be fun um, as another topic just to hit on sort of a range of things to, while we're here together today to sort of talk about what are some of the like trends or kind of like issues of the day, kind of spotlight topics that are coming up in the sector. Um, each of you uh, who are listening today from where you sit may have touched on some of these. If there are others that you want to build on when we, when we open up the conversation. But I was thinking about a few that have come up for me. And I thought I'd just share those and then pass it off to you. Um, one is, and you touched on this earlier today, Kelly, we had some pre-interviews here, is the whole topic of listening and feedback. And... Um, some philanthropy is by its very nature embedded in community, and listening and feedback is core to how that philanthropy operates. But that's not universally the case, right? Mm -hmm. There, um, Kelly works at the Blank Foundation, the CEO of Blank Faye talks about when she first started at the Gates Foundation, and she felt sort of nestled off, like in the Pacific Northwest, sometimes quite far from the people and communities that the Gates Foundation was working to serve. That's also true for the Hewlett Foundation on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park. Sand Hill Road's one of the most famous sort of like venture capital, Silicon Valley avenues. Um, a lot of the things Hewlett works on are very far away from Sand Hill Road. And the same is certainly true at MLA, where we're working all over the, the globe on youth mental health and well-being and engaging young leaders in climate change. And so I, I, I'm really thankful that this is a topic that we're going to be paying more attention to. And I think my observation is that foundations really can kind of open those doors and build those bridges and be true partners to community, but we have to build, we have to do the work and make the investment and have the systems to say, we're not necessarily here to have the answers. Mm -hmm. We need to have systems to listen, whether that's going out and doing community meetings, hiring people from within communities where you work, maybe even moving the office you know, into those communities. There's a lot of different ways to listen. Kelly and I were part of supporting a nonprofit called Listen for Good that any nonprofit that serves clients can use. Um, you, can, you can test people surveys, you can do 
paper surveys. I think they do it in 50 languages. But it's a way to say, hey, how are, how are you experiencing this program? And where are we serving you well? Where can we do better? And, you know, philanthropy has money. And money is a source of power. And so sometimes foundations can you know, get away with not listening. But there's so much power, I think, in um, really want to see change in opening up this avenue to listen. So and listening and closing that loop. And closing that loop So back. that's one of the biggest things is when we listen, we want to make sure that what we hear, we let folks know what we did with it. Right? And so that's the hardest part, but for me, most, the most important thing It is well. because you really, to, to, to close the loop and share what you heard, I think, and this gets to actually two other, I want to hit on two more quick themes and then I'm going to hand it to you, cover as many trends and philanthropy as you want. Those are sort of um, understanding and finding the true cost of work and kind of trust-based philanthropy, as you may have heard. And to me, both of those rely on that ability to, to be in candid relationships, to hear not only the good, but also the hard, and to say, all right, let's work with what isn't working make it better. So on true cost, I think one of the, if I could leave a wand, well, I would do a lot of things in the world if I could leave a wand, but if I could take away what's known as the overhead myth, my wand, I would, because maybe 20 years ago, this idea, the nonprofit rating sites, that we need objective measures to know if a nonprofit is effective. Let's use how much overhead they have, how much they spend on fundraising, administration, as though that measures anything about how effective they are not. In fact, all it does is either force you to game the system and give a number that isn't real or to totally underinvest in your people um, and your facility. And we know more than ever, this is, when you walk in a room like this, you feel different. And if you walk in a tired room with no quote unquote overhead, you know, the sound panels, the beautiful ceiling, the microphones, this is overhead, right, for the Baldry Center. And yet it's important. So I think that's another trend that I really encourage on the funder side funders to be open to hearing what it really costs. And on the nonprofit side, for nonprofits to have the courage to share what it really costs. Um, because I think that way we can not only do the work better, but we can treat the people doing the work better. And if we don't have this amazing nonprofit workforce in our country, we're, we lose a huge thing. So I think that's true cost. And then the last one is this idea of trust based philanthropy. And, and there, I guess, what I have observed, I think it's something we really practice um, and value deeply at the Enlight Foundation, is that it, that it starts based in relationships, right? And yes, there's paperwork and due diligence and um, risk assessment and measurement and all of those things, but it's saying, what are you centering in the philanthropy? Are you centering the paperwork? Are you centering the due diligence analysis? Or are you centering the relationship that you have with the people? across the table, and um, and we're going to talk more about this. I think Kelly is going to go on in the conversation, but, but you, if you don't have that ability to have that kind of relationship with each other, then I think you lose a huge source of power in trying to make that change together. You don't see yourselves as being on the same team. That You, know, you think about if one person's throwing an oar in the water and somebody else picks up an oar, like that canoe or whatever you're rowing can go a lot faster, right? And so I think of it as like, how can we get funders and nonprofits like rowing and, and working together versus when there isn't that trust-based grounding, sometimes people either not rowing or rowing opposite each other. That's probably enough of the rowing metaphor. What are, um, what are trends that you're seeing from where you sit at Blank? I think the other mic sounded funny. Did it, right? Okay, that was not just me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a phrase that we're hearing all over the place, E, E, I, M, B, from diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, lots of folks heard more and more about this uh, after George Floyd was murdered. Um, many organizations, universities, nonprofits, um, and you know, folks in general started paying attention to uh, the issue of race, the issue of um, police, policing uh, in that manner, how harmful it is, uh, and things like that. And so I just want to talk about that as a trend of philanthropy 
Um, some philanthropies were doing excellent work in racial justice and those kind of things way before this happened because it is a uh, an issue. Um, I was in a workshop uh, at, in Atlanta that was hosted by our chairman, Arthur Blank, uh, yesterday after reading a book called The Infinite Game. And he, he just talked about how some, some life is an infinite game, right? And so uh, racial justice and justice issues are infinite. We will always work in that area. It's not going to go away. We won't win at it, right? And so um, that it's one of the issues that many not many philanthropies were focused on um, and have been historically focused on. But after we all kind of shared in seeing what was happening with policing, um, um, that wasn't the way policing was supposed to happen in our country. Uh, some paid more attention. And some started departments that were DEI departments, and some uh, hired folks and just did things in a little bit of a different way to pay attention to the issue in a more intentional way, I'll say. And so um, I lead the DEI and D Council, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council at the Arthur and Blank Family Foundation. And our intent is the B um, at the end of the phrase, which is belonging, because we just um, believe that. It's very, very important. When you're spending eight hours, eight to 10, eight to 12, these long days that we spend in places where we work, we don't want to go to a place where we don't feel like we belong or where we feel like we have to stay in our office or stay in our workstation because we can't bring our authentic self to work. And so the purpose and the focus of, of our work is to ensure that everyone that works at the foundation, we have staff in Atlanta and in Montana, we do grant making in Montana. Our, our chairman um, owns ranches in Montana, and we do a lot of grant making there as well. And so not just staff in the building in Atlanta, but also in Montana, that they feel like they belong at the foundation, that they're doing work that they're passionate about, that, they're, that they're, they're being listened to. One of our values is listen and respond. And so when staff, um, whether local or um, outside of or in Montana, raise concerns as chief of staff, it's my job to hear those concerns and, and, and be able to respond. Even if it's something that we can't fix right now, I need to be able to say, hey, I hear you. And I know that that is a concern. And here's some things that we're doing to address the concern. Um, but it doesn't mean that you know everybody's going to get a $25,000 raise tomorrow. Um, you know, there, there's def definitely things that can happen, but, but that's a part of belonging. Folks to be able to bring themselves to work and know that they can be who they are, that they can be sad if something sad has happened in their family, that they actually can cry at work and not be feeling like they're treated like they're a weak um, that there's, there's a place and a space for us to be at work, just like we can be at home or in community or at church or in other places. Um, and so when I think about um, some people think that, uh, you know, DEI efforts are like lip service. Like, oh, they're just doing that. They're just checking a box. I think it's lip service when it's, okay, we're going to we're gonna um, do one training and that's it. And that should fix what you're feeling about. That should help you feel more comfortable about race or gender or, or, or other issues like that. It's, it's not a one and done. It really is, um, um, I think it's lifelong work um, for us to get to know each other better. How do we get the news together? Spending together. Ryan Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative talks about getting proximate, going to the ground. I, I call it going to the ground because that's what I did for my career. Half my career, I'm in community, on the ground, with community, understanding needs and concerns and being able to address them in that way. One of the things that I um, actually wrote down was um, that when we pay attention to issues in community, um, like what happened with Trayvon Martin, like what happened with Breonna Taylor, like what happened with George Floyd. One of the things we can't do is then come at um, our our um, our you know our police as if every single solitary police officer is the worst thing that ever happened. My first cousins are police officers, so I'm not going to hate. I'm going to get to more understanding. There's some systemic issues that we know. Um, uh, in that in that area, and so paying attention to those areas, we want to we do our work from a pluralistic view. That's one of the things that Faye has really brought into 
the Arthur and Blank Family Foundation. What does that mean, pluralism? I even had to ask the question because we didn't use that phrase in most of the places that it was in the past. And so when we think about pluralism, we just think about um, um, seeing people for who they are, where they are. You know, we, we have, you know, Christians and Jewish folk and uh, Black folks and Hispanic folk, and Asian folk and Native Americans. We want to learn about the journey, the opportunity, the fight, um, um, and the pathways of all of those who are here, not just in the United States, but even outside of the, of the United States. And so it's not a Black thing, D-E-I-B. It is a, it's a people thing. <laughs> I'll say it that way. And so that's one thing that I would love to, for philanthropy to just be clear about when they, when they say D-E-I, that it's not just a trendy word to say but that it's something that um, if we're working in community, we need to understand who that community is. We can't do that from our nice offices downtown. We have to go to the ground and spend time with community to understand who they are. And that's a real important part of our work at the Blank Foundation. Our um, staff, they do site visits. You know, they're, they're, they're sitting, they're going to different events. They're learning about the different areas of, of, of you know, what's happening out in the community and the areas that we're funding in, which is health and well-being, um, youth development, environment, focused on energy and land out in Mount Montana, um, democracy, but also uh, the west side of Atlanta, we have an enduring commitment to Atlanta's west side, because that's where the stadium is, um, where the Falcons play, our chairman is the owner of the Falcons, and so making sure that we're focusing on that community and uh, helping them in the affordable housing realm, as well as economic advancement is important. A lot of times what you see around the country is these incredible stadiums come into communities um, and drive out the community uh, so that the community can no longer remain where generations of them have been. And so we're working to make sure that folks have a choice. You know, we can all move whenever we want to move, but you also got to have a choice to be able to stay in the community that grandma, you know, raised you up in, in that. The other thing is, is, is around um, faith communities and faith faith. You know, oftentimes you'll see different um, philanthropies that, you know, their websites say, we don't fund churches or we don't fund um, faith-based efforts. And, and then there are some that definitely do. But one of the reasons why some philanthropies do not uh, fund faith-based efforts is because they are um, hesitant about proselytizing. What is that? What's that word mean? <laughs> that just means that, you know, they, they don't want their uh, grant uh, monies to be used to uh, try to convince someone to come on over to my, come on over to my belief, leave your beliefs on the side, and then I'll help you over here. And that's philanthropy behaving badly or, or, or organizations, grantees behaving badly if that is how they're using those resources. Um, I, I think about, it makes me think about the civil rights movement. And the base of the civil rights movement was the church. You know, they, they, when, you, when you pull up those pictures of Martin Luther King Jr. and all of those other leaders, um, um, uh, Ida B. Wells and um, um, just Fannie Lou Hamer and many of those other uh, great women and men that were in that movement, a lot of those photos are when they were at a church. Not, and it was about using the church as a community resource, right? And so when I think about um, um, philanthropy, uh, in my experience in working with the Skillman Foundation in Detroit, Michigan, I was one of their community engagement consultants at one point. And uh, we had a lot of faith-based organizations that were involved in that work with us because why? They were involved in their communities. You know, they were focused on the needs of the people in the community. And so there, I, I'll never forget, we were in the Brightmore section of Detroit, and we were in the basement of this church. There was probably 200 people, tables back to back, and we're talking about what is best for those kids in that community. And we're talking with parents and making sure that, you know, the young people in that basement are, are, are being able to be a part of making the community better. And so when we found when we were engaged at that level, we were being funded by the School of Foundation because they were interested in helping that community be better. And so we were that community that was coming in and really listening and responding and co-designing the path forward with the community that Skillman then would ultimately fund so those, um, so, so those folks could work in community together. So 
I do encourage um, foundations to pay attention to what's happening. When I lived in California, I went to a, um, a Victory and Praise Church in Stockton, California. Um, but it wasn't just the church. It was really the social response uh, to many, many needs in the community, and they weren't able to get a lot of grants to support them in that work. And so that is just something that we wanted to make sure that we look at, oh, that's a church, they can't do anything, or, oh, that's an organization that um, only serves this particular people, they can't do anything. It actually takes a village. It takes all of us, all of these organizations to be able to um, address the significant that we have. Um, that we have a, you want to add anything to that? So that, that's some of the trends. And again, if you all are seeing things or have questions about things, it's sort of the, I think of it as kind of like the big circle around the sector, if I'm drawing a diagram. But, but another thing I want to talk about today is kind of, right? So Kelly, I think I can speak to you and say, we're, we're big believers in the, like the demystifying of philanthropy. Like we're here, we want to talk about it, we want to talk about how it works. And, and I think one thing that can sometimes be um, a variety of reasons is like how do decisions in foundations in philanthropy get made? Um, how how are foundations making these assessments and deciding how grant dollars go out? So I, I thought maybe we could add that to our list of, of topics. And and the answer is that there's a joke that like if you've met one foundation, you've met one foundation. And to some degree, that's true. I mean, there could be a hundred different decision mechanisms. Um, but I think we've each had different experiences with how this can go. So I've seen it a, a kind of across the spectrum. I've been part of big open calls for proposals where we have a set of reviewers, we have a rubric. Um, I wouldn't go all the way to saying that's scientific. I mean, humans are still making judgments about things. Um, but that's a pretty a pretty broad um, a broad way to do it. Anybody can apply. A whole set of diverse people are reviewing. We also, in an initiative that Kelly and I supported, we had a participatory process where we had a whole different group of people totally separate from the funders um, and from the communities where the grants were being made. So I, I've seen it done both of those ways. I've also seen quite the opposite, which is like one or two people in the foundation who make the decision, right? That could be the president of the foundation or a board member. It could be the VP or the director. Um, it could be the program officer. And so... I think in that sense, um, if, if any of you listening today are sort of applying for funding or looking for funding, I think it's a really valid question to ask. A, just purely for your own learning, but B, then to understand how is this organization that I'm trying to raise money from going to make this decision about this, um, about this funding and about this process? So I, I think it's always a really good question to ask. Um, I could take Hewlett as one example. A lot of the funding decisions were made between me and my boss. And we would have a meeting every couple of weeks. It was helpful to give it a name. We'd call it like the grant review meeting. It was a second meeting between the two of us, but I gave it a name. And we would talk about the grants that had come up. We would talk about what we were trying to achieve, why we thought it was a fit. But that was a pretty like small, nimble process versus, again, some of the bigger processes. Um, the one other thing I wanted to add, and then I, I want you to chime in, Kelly, with what you think about decision making is. I've also observed something interesting as because a question, in addition to how do I get funding, another question is like, am I going to get more, like once you get one grant, then you're like, am I going to get more grants? And so something I've noticed inside foundations is that there's sometimes kind of a spectrum of where an organization falls vis-a-vis -vis kind of that foundation's commitment. So you can think of it across like a, a, a row, I don't know what I would draw. Um, at one end is like that funder is all in with you. And that means that they'll make introductions for you to other funders. They'll come speak at your events. They'll put their name on things. Like they want to not just give you funding, but they want to really champion what you do. That, again, as we alluded to earlier, I think can be really a win-win situation because you're getting all the orders water. Sometimes for various reasons, the funder isn't really all in. And you would notice that because maybe they don't come for that site visit or they don't want their name on the thing. Or they don't give extra time. And in that case, I think on both sides, it can be helpful to sort of put your finger on why, <laughs> right? Is it that they fund it because the board member told them to, but like the staff isn't as invested in that thing? Did they fund it and then the CEO left and they've never 
gotten to know the new one or trust was broken. Or, you know, there can be a lot of reasons, but I think that is a, I mean, better to have the funding than not. But that can be a precarious spot on both sides because it can mean that the funding is more tenuous. Now, sometimes you can do what I call the, the funder can ha- be like a non financial fan. And that's like, wow, this funder always shows up at our shop. They seem to really like what we do. And yet that foundation isn't popular. Or they keep asking us, you we were talking earlier about an example, like they keep asking us to come speak at their stuff. And in that case, I think the conversation is like, hey, it seems like we have a lot of alignment here, except we're missing the part about the funding. Can we talk about that? Right. And then, of course, you have situations where, for whatever reason, or isn't supportive um, of that work or, or doesn't know about that work. But I think that spectrum on both sides can be really helpful. Like if you're at the nonprofit side, make a map of your funders and like, where do you think you fall? And if you're on the funder side, you know, make a map. Because I, I think it can just help to highlight you know, where there's sort of strength in the pipeline and then where there's maybe something that needs to be addressed. So that's a little bit beyond decision making to sort of thinking about where that grant funding kind of maps out psychologically. Um, what would you think about how their foundations make decisions? I would add um, that particularly if you um, don't have the money until you have the money. <laughs> money isn't a grant until the grant letter is signed. Uh, once the grant letter is signed, I'll say the check is on the way back in the day. Nowadays, ACH is on the way. <laughs> much, much of it it is digital. We had an experience where um, a previous staff member had made a promise um, to an organization that the foundation was interested um, in their work and wanted to make a grant. And that leader took that word as golden and put it to their board that they were getting this big grant um, from the organization. And that actually didn't happen. Um, because we have such a um, uh, tight process of approval. It does come in as a, as a proposal, and many uh, foundations have gone to really doing their, um, their, their solicitation or their RFPs or receiving proposals in electronically. And so, first of all, that proposal needs to be in electronically, and then our program team, our program staff work to make sure that all the eyes are dotted and teams are crossed and the things are there so that they can then move it up the ladder for approval to our president. And then if it's a certain, at a certain level, it then goes to approval to our board of directors. So it's very dangerous for any foundation executive um, or staff person to go out in community and make promises. It does more harm than good. Um, and in this case, we were able to to have a really good talk uh, with the leader of that organization. Um, hopefully down the road, they will be able to access some resources, but it's a really uncomfortable place to be in. And so just understanding that, uh, particularly if you're watching and you are a nonprofit organization and you've had great conversations, it's kind of like having that great interview. I know I'm going to get the offer. I know this job is mine. And then you get the call that's not the not the job, and you're a little bit different, disappointed. Um, it's 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 more than that when it comes to foundations. So just making sure that you go all the way through that process and understand. Um, I work for the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, and we have a live donor. Mr. Blank is alive and well. He chairs our board. These are his resources. We are stewards of the resources that and his family decide to invest in the world to make the world a better place. And so approaching decision-making with humility of who you're working for and why uh, and what that focus is. You have a large foundation or a small foundation. Foundations have a, a focus of things that are important to them. And so the things that I mentioned earlier, these are the things that are important to Mr. Blank and to his children, to his family. This is why we're focused on these things. because These are the areas that they selected because where they want their giving to be. And so that's just another thing that I would add, uh, I would add there. I'm going to um, flip it back to you. Let's talk about the power dynamic. I think we have about nine more minutes. <laughs> um, ten more minutes, thank you. Um, the power dynamic. A lot of people are like, well, foundations have all the money. So if we just change to do foundation says do, 
then we'll get that grant. And I want you to talk about that, Lindsay, because I'm sure that you've had many, many experiences. And I know you have a story on this too, so I'm going to hand it back to you in a minute. Get ready. Um, so uh, it was interesting. I was at my kids' school the other day, and they had they're doing a project on power, and they had a whiteboard, and the kids had been brainstorming like, what are all the sources of power, right? And, and what is a power dynamic as a result? And and I do think in the case of an organization, a foundation, often there's an endowment that's invested, and it's, it's generating funds every year for grant making. Um, that's a position of power. That budget is going to be there every year. Um, there's certainty about that. There is, you don't go through that due diligence process of being questioned. Nobody questions the foundation about what overhead uh, usually uh, is invested in. Whereas for the nonprofit, there's this every single year, this cycle of raising the funding and being kind of in that vulnerable position. These are the people who have the money to decide. Like, you're going to have more money, you can do more things, or you're going to have less. And, and I really feel deeply that it is part of the role of people working in philanthropy to break that down as much as humanly possible. So for example, one thing I did at the Hewlett Foundation is I said, it's a great, my, the organization is a Baldry Center. So in community, but not like, not like a you know, after school program something like that, is I said, it's great for me to come visit here, but you can visit me. Come live inside the foundation with me, not just for an hour, for like two days. And let's walk around. We'll show you how the foundation works. You can go to training and learn the rules that we have for the grants that we make. I called it a reverse site visit. And my reason for doing it, A, Hewlett would let me, which was awesome. And then B, it was really to break down this power dynamic and to say, I think sometimes opacity or like lack of having that candid conversation sort of either advertently or inadvertently uh, adds to exacerbates the power dynamic, right? And so my view is always, how can we break it down? How can we be as transparent as possible? This is who's going to make the decision. This is how the decision is going to get made. This is the guidance that we got from the foundation about how to do it. And the more that you can share all of that, it doesn't need to be a secret. It's not like the CIA or something, you know, it's a foundation. Um, the more I think then we can all be on the same team. If the people raising money have all the information I have, um, I think that can really break it down. The other thing I would add is that often this is about human to human communication. And so if there's someone in a foundation if you're fundraising, they like Kelly just described, they're gonna have to make the case to at least one decision maker above them, probably, if not like four above them. And so part of that um due diligence and that fundraising process, it's helping, helping make sure that person can make the case. So like, do you have what you need to be, um, you know, a champion of this organization? Do you have, are there any concerns? What are you even asking, like, what, what could be the biggest risk for us as you present this funding up the chain and actually having that conversation? Because everything has been, but saying, well, here's how we would address that. Here's how we would address that. I don't think you can get rid of it, but I think the more candor there can be, sort of building that champion something, the, the, the more it mitigates a power dynamic and instead, again, puts everybody's order in the water. What would you add about it? I know you have more experience than we can talk about in eight minutes. Um, just a couple. One, um, is, uh, uh, when there's a level of trust and uh, knowledge and transparency, as what Lindsay, Lindsay was saying, between the foundation and grantees, um, then grantees feel comfortable coming to you with their problems. Um, um, we, you know, oh my gosh, I can't tell the founder, the foundation, because then they may cut off my funding, or I may not get funded again. Uh, those kinds of fears are real because in foundation and philanthropy badly, that can happen. Um, and, and so my experience was a grantee when I was working at a foundation in California um, that had um, discovered an embezzlement that happened inside their organization. And in my portfolio, they had gotten a couple million dollars from our foundation. And, um, and, and you know, unfortunately, it hit the news and the person was convicted. It was, it was bad. It wasn't the CEO. It was someone in, in the... Um, in the finance department uh, where it happened. And 
rather than we find out about it in the news with everyone else, they actually called me and said, okay, um, I, I got something to share. <laughs> it's not good news and it's very concerning, but we want to tell you about it so that you're not blindsided by it and so that we can let you know what things we put in place to mitigate this concern going forward. And so we had that conversation. I took the conversation to my leaders um, at the foundation who then also had to inform our board of directors because it was all over the news. And this was one of our three grants. And so I would say that if, we, if I was operating in power over that grantee instead of empowered with that grantee to help them get that work done, I don't know that they would have been comfortable enough to make that call um, um, at that time. And so there's like, like Lindsay said, we could talk all day <laughs> and share different things that we've learned and that we've seen and why in our work today, it's very, very important for us to operate in humility, to do that listening, know that um, even as chief of staff, I'm not on the ground doing grant making like I used to, but what I learned in community, I've brought into the foundation staff, give them an, uh, an opportunity to come in share ideas and for concerns, respond, you know, um, all of those kinds of things I think are very, very important when we when we talk about the power dynamic. And I think that we're we're, we're close to closing, but let's talk a little bit about work life balance. You know, because in foundations, sometimes we act like we're uh, doing heart surgery and we go, 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 go like the energizer bunny. Um, and we have to slow ourselves down. And I'll just say that, you know, one of the ways um, that I slow down is because uh, my daughter and son-in-law had three kids, and they live 15 minutes from me. And they're five and uh, five and three and eight. And so I get to play with the kids <laughs> as a as a way of coming out of work and really just kind of leaning into family. I, I get to travel with my husband, who's retired, um, um, all over the world when we have the, the opportunity to. And 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 I've started doing more leaving work on time intentionally like okay that's enough for today and then come back fresh uh the next day and there's been something very um i don't know freeing about looking at the clock and not just me but reminding my team okay okay y'all come on we we did it today it's time to go home and get some rest and so just understanding that, that is as important as the work that we do every day what about you Lindsay? i think it's such a a really important topic and uh, there was just a big headline article in the Chronicle Philanthropy about burnout in the nonprofit sector and of course we're all reading a lot about just post covid there's like an added layer of sort of pandemic burnout and, um, so it's a topic i've thought a lot about and read a lot about and i do think one of the things we know is that um there's what you can do inside of work to manage it so looking at are, you know too much on someone's plate are the wrong things on their plate Somebody, once more I read, you manage your energy, not just your time. And so I think it can be really powerful to take that even 30 minutes of self reflection to say, let me look at everything I do in a week or a month. Where am I energized? Where am I depleted? And then can I work around that? And or is this something to have a conversation with the team about like, hey, this thing is, you know, maybe I have to do it on a choice, but maybe somebody else on the team like loves to do that thing and you could you know, do a little experiment and trade. So I, I think there's sort of a an intentionality that has to come inside of work or your intention of like, we're going to shut the laptop, we're going to go home. Um, and then also having more things outside that you're setting it for. Um, so like I have a friend who's been experiencing a lot of burnout in a foundation she works in and she signed up for a pottery class. She's like, I just I have to go. And I have to be there. And she feels so much better when she's done it. So, um, I think for me, I, I have kids right now, and so at their home, and so and they're they're in middle school, and I can feel how fast they're going to be eighteen, and do what they're supposed to do, and go out into the world, and so I'm really considering those nights popping in their bedrooms and the weekends of driving them wherever they still want me to drive them. Um, you know, mom, I kind of hate you, but first of all, you take me to the mall, kind of the ways that we're <laughs> that we're in, and so um, that's a big motivator. You know, for me, um, to to have that to have that balance, and and I do think, particularly for folks that are in positions of power or authority, 
you know, it's which model matters, right? So somebody who says, no, no, it's fine, close your laptop, and then they never close their laptop. Um, I knew a foundation where they, they really had some creep on this issue, and people were emailing at night and late, and they made a rule. They just said no emails between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. So if you want, you know, schedule send is like your favorite tool in all of email, but you had to schedule send it for the next morning. So because there is something about if you see it, you know, then you start to think about it. I also think, you know, we did, this wasn't so much about the content of work, but um, we're really fortunate at the Enlight Foundation to work on youth mental health and well-being. And um, there are so many questions about what all the technology and all the information coming at us all the time does to our brains. And so I do think this another small habit has been, you know, like putting the phone down. Or for a long time, um, at the Hewlett Foundation, I had two phones. So that the work email went to the work phone and I could like put it in the drawer because I do think that that, um, that sort of always being able to check it and always being on. Now, I don't check my work email unless I can address my work email at the time I'm checking it. Because for me, reading at 7 o'clock, not that I have so many problems in my inbox, but if I read about it at 7 o'clock at night, I'm going to think about it. So I think being intentional too about when we, like not just visually engaging and then like hoping our brains will turn off so that's like a weird note to end on um but maybe we'll open it up um don't let the phone control you that's the, um what do you all want to talk about in the room we'll, we'll send this mic oh you're gonna do it for us even better add your thoughts here i think she'll bring this right here maybe Yeah. So, so we're talking about foundation, we're talking about public service. And it is incredibly hard to get changes uh, yes. from the foundation. We only something quite specific, and, and I understand the answer where the foundation was coming from. But what advice, what counsel do you need to do to the volunteer? Yeah. How do we get to the general office? It can be a very broad area. Yeah. But I find foundation to really zoom in on the internet project. Yeah. It makes it hard to A, to fill out a need, you end up making something, get the grant that really doesn't, it's not a net gain. You want to start? You want me to start? I have a couple of, I don't have a, a magic solution to that one, but it's another huge topic. Um, and trend, and I would say a couple of things. One thing I've observed is that I do think sometimes the general operating support and this kind of trust-based idea go together, and often a first grant from a funder will be restricted. And I think it's almost a way for them of like feeling some amount of control, even though, let's be honest, like they're going to give you the money, you're going to do the work. I'm not sure it really makes a difference in terms of control. But what I've often observed is once that relationship is there and that they're not as like afraid of whatever risk maybe from funding something new, can be a really good time to open the conversation. Hey, your foundation has funded us once, twice, three times before for this work. Would you consider, now that we know each other, now that you know I'm going to deliver for you, would you consider unrestricting that funding? If they will, great. Another thing you could say is unrestrict the funding but we will still make sure as part of reporting to you that we tell you about this project you really care about because sometimes it's a measurement issue. Technically, a foundation can't give you general support and then say, tell us you know, how many, how many stories you've had on mental health. They can't, the lawyers don't like it. So if you make it easy and say, we wanted to assure you as part of reporting back to you on general support, we know you care about mental health, we are gonna continue that work. Sometimes the way we described it at Hewlett was a Venn diagram of what's your work and what's their work and if there's enough of a band in the middle then that's the case for general support and i guess the last thing i would say is if you can't get them there a project vendor really really in this day and age should be giving you your full overhead rate on a project and so, so if you can't get them anywhere else saying hey well t we're so grateful to have support for that project but we still do need every grant otherwise some other funder is is covering that for them right? They're sort of not carrying their weight. And so that can be another framing, too, is this is the sort of, that's what that idea of true cost funding. 
like the project plus the, the overhead. So that's a few ideas. She's a genius. That's why I'm up here with her. <laughs> um, uh, the only thing that I would add is uh, the foundation really getting to know the organization drives that up. And so we're we're invitation only at the at the Blank Foundation, and so we don't put out RFPs or requests for proposals, um, except for in the work that we do in Montana. That's how that work works um, uh, primarily. But in, in, in the rest of our, our giving, we're invitation only. What does that mean? That means that our team, our staff in all of our giving areas are the ones that are really looking out and reaching out to organizations that they see are aligned with the strategies that our board has approved that we want to implement. And so they're reaching out to get to know organizations at a deeper level from the beginning. And so getting to know those organizations and then um, uh, being able to understand the full measure of what they're doing, um, shame on us if we see an organization that has that that overlap, like what Lindsay just said, is fully aligned, is killing the game, is really doing it, and we say, oh, but we only, only want to fund this one little piece over here. Instead, we believe that the, the impact that we get out of our funding, funding them for, to do what they're doing, do the work that they're great at. We've discovered that this work is great. We've discovered that our investment will really help that organization uh, continue to move that work forward. Um, um, it's a blessing to be able to offer that organization general operating support. Because, you know, I, I used to say to my team when I worked in, at Irvine uh, Foundation in San Francisco, th this is like the golden egg um, for many organizations because it's so hard to come by. So let's make sure that we understand the, the depth of the organization. So then when we have to be the advocate inside the foundation to say, this is why I am suggesting, recommending strongly that this be a general operating grant that can answer all of those questions and, and, and make that happen. I do think it takes both understanding and knowing the organization at a deeper level, sometimes through the grant making, like what Lindsay said, but also just being on the ground. Thank you. We do have some a uh, couple of questions that I have given to Jasmine that came in earlier, knowing that you ladies were going to be here. Uh, Jasmine, unique qualities of the can you repeat the last part? Um, okay, I'm not trying to be glib, but Terry Braden, um, we, we want to replicate her. <laughs> Just the heart for helping people understand what philanthropy is. Um, you know, a foundation is more than just a grant where you get a check and you, you get to do some work because you got that check. You actually get a chance to learn and grow. I, I, we have so many grantees, guys, that it would be disingenuous to say, because the philanthropy center is here, here's what could happen with those organizations. I do, however, I learned at dinner last night with Ms. Braden that this is the only philanthropy center in, H in any HBCU anywhere in the world. Um, what, is, is that correct? That's what they say. That's saying. what they told her. So that's what I'm saying. And so I, I do think that we can help raise awareness that this center is here because the center obviously is open to bringing in individuals to share education and knowledge. And we have so many grantees doing so much incredible work. Those are grantees that could, particularly those that operate in the southeast region of the country, that should know that this center is here and that they too could either benefit from the um, um, experiences like this, the sessions and the learning that comes out of it, or they could contribute to it. What would you add? I agree with all of that. I think that philanthropy centers at universities are, are a really special thing. Again, there aren't that many in this country. This is one of the HBCU. You could probably count on your hands. Centers. And I think the unique thing is being based in a university. It means you get the scholarship. 
from professors, graduate students, undergrads, and undergrads and graduates out into the world having had this, this additional training. The nonprofit workforce is a huge part of the U.S. workforce. And whether you're on the philanthropy side, the fundraising side, the programmatic side, um, I think the opportunity to also be for the university to, to be a citizen in the community that it's in, both in Baton Rouge, but it's across the South, right? To have a philanthropy center based here is different than to have one based in Stanford, to have one based at the university. And what are, I think the Baldry Center has done a great job in getting started, and I'm sure will continue to, at bringing the unique features of, of, this, of this place, of this community, of this state, of the people who live here, of the history of this place. How does that shape what the social sector and philanthropy look like today and what it could look like and bring in the voices. I think it's really unique to say we can represent voices here out in the broader philanthropic sector because when you're based in an academic institution, it gives you a lot of cachet, right, out in the world um, to say, hey, we're, we're based in an HBCU, we're based in another university, and, and here are some of the things that we have to share out in the sector. So I see all of that happening already, and I also think so much potential for that in the future. Yes, I agree. And also, too, I resonate with the Author and Bank Foundation because I was one of the 100 students that was sent to Atlanta for the Black Business Sports Symposium. Yay! So I was very thrilled to be a part of it as well. So it goes into our next question of, as you reflect on your career, is there any decisions that you would change? Thank you. You're right. That is a great question. Are there any decisions I would change? I think that I would have, you know how you can kind of stumble into a career. And so I would have wanted as a young person to understand more about the philanthropy sector from a learning standpoint versus an experience standpoint. So I really came up under, you know, a key leader who taught me, he just taught me, a grant. he taught me how to facilitate, he taught me about community. He taught me so much that I draw from, this is my uncle that I, I mentioned earlier, um, and and I still, you know, lean into some of those lessons today, like honor the work, the work will honor you. Um, but I I learned it from doing, like from the from the micro part of it, like, okay, what's a grant? Oh, you want to write a grant report? What does that mean? tell the foundation what we did in this grant. Okay, but what does that mean? Um, we have a, um, um, I have to give Jody Nelson a shout out. So Jody Nelson is a managing director of Effective Philanthropy at the, um, uh, at the foundation, at the Arthur and Blank Family Foundation. And I was watching her do some work one time and I said, you know what, Jody, if I'd have known you at the beginning of my career, man, my strategy chop would have been so much stronger. And she was like, what? <laughs> you know, thank you for saying that. But I really meant it because I didn't learn strategy at a level that allowed me to be able to say, this is how you put together a really strong, tight strategy. This is how you measure that really strong, uh, tight strategy. And then this is how you then know whether that grant made a difference or not. So that's what I would have done differently, was really kind of go into maybe a philanthropy center like this to learn more about the philanthropic sector when I was working at a nonprofit as young. If I can add on to that, please. Says oh, hey, Terry. You know, we're in this building because of that same thing. Leon and Lauren Vault's vision was to get back to his alma mater that gave him in a learned way. And so he took his learning career, went west to California, made his fortunes with his families. And what did they first want to do? They wanted to get back to their alma mater. So this building is their vision that has been, been in their minds since they left here in, 19, in the 1950s. That was perfect. Um, it's a really great question. I don't, I don't answer it from a place of like any, any regrets per se. I feel like everything has led on the path, but... A couple of things that I have found to be perhaps have outsized importance. In the I feel really lucky that my first job out of business school at Goodwill, they were like, 
all in on meeting and process facilitation. And I got to learn so many. I, I think the most useful thing I probably do on a daily basis is like plan and run a good meeting. And that might sound like so silly, but we spend so much time in those rooms. And if you can make that time that is sort of like fun, satisfying, and significant for people, and they want to come back and you can you know, keep a process moving because of the meeting. And, I, and, I, and so I feel lucky that I had that early. Something that I think we do more and more in school that I took maybe longer to develop, I, I think back to this whole power dynamic point, it's really important to be able to have hard conversations and to be able to ask questions, to question things, to say, hey, this isn't this isn't working or we can't do it this way. And I think for a variety of reasons that include power dynamics in the world, I was probably more committed about some of those conversations earlier. And I probably twisted myself into a few pencil knots that I could have spared myself if I could have taken on this topic more directly. So some people are, are have that skill earlier on, but if I could go back and talk to my 22-year-old self, I would say, you can be more direct about this topic today. Um, you don't have to wait 20 years. Okay. So we have another question in the audience. Okay. Um. So um, good afternoon. Your major in elementary education. And so my question is to you. I am a Be The Match volunteer. This organization is a national marijuana donor program, and what we do is we partner with community organizations to be African Americans to donate to the state. Yes, I I would say if we define philanthropy as giving time, talent, and treasure, so treasure is the the dollar part, and we we'll talk more about that today. I think the part because it's the part that doesn't get mystified as easily, like up on the hill and what goes on in there. But I, I absolutely think that um, giving of your time and your talent, whether as a volunteer or if you ultimately were to like work in an organization like that, um, it's absolutely a form of philanthropy. I think philanthropy comes from a Greek word, which is like love of humankind. And so to me, there's like nothing. I did a be a match drive when my son had leukemia. Um, she's multiracial. It's really hard to find matches. Like, that's it huge way of showing love to humankind. Thank you. Thank you. Great question, Taylor. Um, do we have any uh, Can I ask Devinder, can you check out chat at the moment in my absence from the computer to see if we have any online chat from our visitors here? I'm just happy to see everybody here in person, and those of you who are watching us live on YouTube at the College Center for Philanthropy, listening to our wonderful speakers, Kelly Gully and Lindsay Lewis that have joined us today. One from Atlanta, Georgia with the Arthur Blank Family Foundation. And of course, Lindsay hailing all the way from the West Side in California. Uh, so if we have no questions in the chat at this time, then what I would like to do is again, just thank you all very much for being here with us today. And we also have some other public announcements, correct? So I wanna thank the Arthur Blank Found Family Foundation for allowing Kelly Gully to join us today. I'd like to um, also thank the In Life Foundation for letting their CEO come and join us today for this fabulous fireside chat. But one I must really share, they both had an experience with the Hewlett Foundation, and that is who is sponsoring our activities today, our event today, and has for the past 20, 24 months at least. Um, and thank you very much, Lindsay, for uh, reading about us in that chronicle a few years ago and have been a strong supporter while you were at Hewlett and then bringing this awesome other partner uh, in philanthropy with you today to have this awesome chat. We want to also thank here in the audience, we have WRKF um, 89.3 here. They have also done some, um, helped us to promote this activity today, including us in their newsletter. We thank you very much. Barbara has been to all of our events this academic year, twice last semester, and also today. Um, she also came last month as well. We want to thank Janice uh, Edwards of the Unlimited uh, Media Production. She assisted in the coaching of our students and myself to get us prepared for our earlier uh, interview chat that we had with both of our, uh, our guests today. It will also precede this recorded um, activity today. So when you all log in again, the first that you will see is our wonderful mass communication students. 
our criminal justice student, and as well as our elementary education students who are also foundation interns and grant talkers here at Southern University System Foundation here at the Voucher Center for Philanthropy. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your Founders Week. Have a good evening. Goodbye. You know, we, we've, I was so excited because everything is just flowing so well. I forgot to present our guest, our gift. So something was missing, right? <laughs> so, you know, when our guest came to, um, came in yesterday, um, when they arrived today in the daylight, they saw this wonderful mural on the wall outside, started taking pictures of it. Our driver did take them down this morning to do the bluff and, uh, and to tour them on the campus. Well, ladies, what I'd like to share with you is a signed print from Terrence Osborne. <laughs> now, these are not framed at this time, but we will frame them and we will mail them you. Don't be stingy. Uh, but uh, unless our tech team has um, a visual of the print that he can show, those of you who are in person, it's the mural on the wall. But it is a mural. Thank you. 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 Thank you.